Hey guys, Dave from Nerdarchy, for Nerds by Nerds, and today I'm hanging out with uh, our staff and editor Doug, as well as Wolfgang Bauer from Kobold Press. And I, I secretly suspect, suspect he actually is really a kobold, because I have never actually seen him yet. Your cameras don't work in the dark. <laughs> How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. I'm here in the Cobalt Warrens in Kirkland, Washington. It's rainy and icy outside, and I'm I'm hiding my nocturnal self from the sun. So. Uh, today we just got a little rain here in New Jersey, but no no ice. Thank thankfully, not yet. We won't see that for another month or two. Yeah, it's coming. Cool. The ice is coming. Winter's coming. Yeah, pretty much. So today's kind of like a special day for you guys that you had mentioned. It totally is. This. Friday the 13th, the 13th of October, five years ago, is the day uh, Cobalt Press launched the Midgard campaign setting. At least sure. a party. Happy birthday. Yeah. Facebook showed me a picture from the launch event. I'm sitting there. It's like Bruce Cordell and Monty Cook and Crystal Frazier and all the people of the Seattle gaming community uh, hanging out and celebrating a, a new campaign world. And I'm like, Really? It's been five years? Yeah, it's been five years. There's some awesome people to celebrate a uh, celebrate a new campaign world with. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I invited, I don't know, the people I've gamed with over the years and the people I've worked at, I don't know, six different companies with and the people I know who would say, oh, a new campaign setting. Well, let me see some of that. So, um, yeah, we had this geek alehouse Um that was more than willing to uh, to host a very large event um, of people who were hungry and thirsty and willing to hang out and play games. So, so that's exactly right. what we did. Um, I don't know. We're we're looking at the next edition coming up in a couple months here, and so <laughs> I, I'm not celebrating this anniversary as heavily as I might have. Partly because I'm I'm like literally pulling myself off proofing files and answering editorial queries to do uh, to do the show with you guys. <laughs> well, we appreciate know what you mean. The time. Yeah, no, I definitely love taking the time. It's good to have a break. But uh, after the show, I'm going right back to answering some of my editor's questions about uh, Elvish history. And she had other questions. I'm like, really? Well, I guess that's a good question. Yeah, we can put that in there. So um, we're hammering on getting the next edition out. So when you say the next edition, is that like a? Are you talking a full conversion of mid, everything Midgard to five e? Well, it's the core campaign setting plus a player's book, for both fifth edition, uh, and an update to the Pathfinder one, because uh, you know five years of new Pathfinder that's also a bunch. So um, we felt that needed a refresh, but the main thing is the conversion to five e, because. Uh, <laughs> Because it's 5e. Yeah. I mean, we've done big chunks of it. We've done pieces of the magic system in the Deep Magic series. We've done dozens of races, player races, um, in three heroes books, the Midgard Heroes, Southlands Heroes, and my favorite, Unlikely Heroes, which still cracks me up because it it is a strong seller, even though it's like, it's the Darrow and the Swagen and the... Else is in there? Like the Lamia is in there. <laughs> like you want to play love playing monsters, man. Yeah, it's the monsters book. And before Volos came out, um, there were a pretty short list of races, and now it's expanded some. Um, but yeah, we we did those so that you could play all those races in Midgard, and uh, it seems seems to be the sort of thing you'd want to collect. So we're putting it all together in something called the Midgard Heroes Handbook. It's basically a player's handbook for Midgard. It's got like 300 new spells and a dozen new races and all this equipment um, and new clerical domains uh, and subclasses, including the martial wow. types. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's like 300 pages, just every school of magic, um, new equipment, some new magic items. Um, yeah, we're, we're sort of going all in. Um, That's the Cobalt Press way, right? It kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I looked at like the Pantheon and I said, hmm, I've got all these gods who have, you know, 
areas of expertise not covered in the paltry number of domains in the core SRD, uh, the core player's handbook. It's like, where am I going to get all those? Oh, wait, I know. We're going to create them. <laughs> um, so like there's, what are some of the favorites? There's one for runes. There's one for dragons. There's one for the moon, which has, I mean, light I like the sound in of that. that direction, but yeah. And then some that are pure evil, like darkness. Um, Doug's just looking for the new things to steal for a spell jammer game. I know. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I mean the whole void magic thing. I, oh yeah. I seem to remember you picked up chunks of that, right, Doug? Yep, that and the Illumination Magic also. Which, oddly, uh, is about Shadow a lot, so that Moon Magic thing sounds pretty intriguing to me. Yeah, I mean, we have a Moon Goddess in Midgard. She's got a lot of followers. We've got Shadow Elves. They're big on Hecate and, and the Moon. Uh, all the Sea Gods have their, their Moon connections. It's like, we should have... And then all the Weir creatures up in the Northlands. They've got uh, a whole kingdom of Weir Bears up there and Bear Folk. And so it's like, we've got five or six power centers that all kind of point toward the night and moonlight. Um, and for me, that domain is about, it's about being nocturnal without being evil, right? Mm -hmm. um, which, I don't know, you can argue about Cobalt Lyman if you want to, but uh, the assumption is, right, a lot of nocturnal creatures got to be the bad guys. And I don't know, sometimes they're- but Somebody's got to protect people at night too. Yeah, exactly. So you got your bear folk ranger out there, or you. I, yeah. I don't know. You know, I have a couple of chinchillas, and they're nocturnal, and I think <laughs> they might be evil. <laughs> <laughs> but they're so soft and furry and adorable. They absolutely are. Every, every they and, and they can also chew through anything that isn't glass or steel. Oh wow! Oh yeah, they're some kind of rodent. They have those teeth, right? Yeah, yeah. They actually have to chew, or their teeth will give them bad problems, or whatever. You know, we played we played a game of Pathfinder run by Stephen Rowe, uh, in in Midgard, and I believe Doug, you played like some kind of ghoul, right? Yeah, it was a dracul or uh huh, the dracul or the the yeah. intelligent ghouls who have their own empire in Midgard. Yeah, it was a cool character. Yeah, well, I'm glad you like them. That was, I mean, that goes way back to the Kingdom of the Ghouls stuff, sort of thematically. That was like Dungeon 70. Um, but in Midgard, there's an Empire of the Ghouls. Mm -hmm. and I just always thought that vampires, ghouls, a whole bunch of the undead were sort of naturals for um, a social race, a really evil social race. Because, um, you know, you see this in Vampire the Masquerade, right? You've got elders and you've got their um, various spawn and clans and whatnot and as a group they're incredibly powerful and awesome villains because you can't kill them all at once um, <laughs> oh let me ask you a question necromancers are they good or evil you know i have a soft spot for necromancers so i'll admit that most of them are evil but they're great villains and uh and we have something called the white necromancer from Cobalt Press that is sort of, we call them a white necromancer. They're more gray. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're not pure evil. They're, they're, I didn't think that ghoul race seemed evil to me because uh, uh, I didn't know all the lore. So like just on the character, she was just like, you've been brought back to life and you, you know, uh, appreciate every moment because you know the next time you die it'll be good and I was like oh that's kind of a hopeful message so like it didn't even occur to me that like the well, cool part of it you had to read between the lines Doug it is also <laughs> evil a flesh eating ghoul <laughs> yeah the, the flesh eating blood drinking kind of side of the undead you know they try to minimize that they have lobbyists who are always saying you know what it's a fantasy world everybody's got to eat something man like same thing with like mind flares you know it's like oh they eat your brains like so what we eat hamburgers that's just what they that's eat right. it's a crazy you world entities ghouls are pretty much of the opinion that all other that living things are like cows right they're <laughs> yeah. there to be eaten that's their purpose <laughs> right. yeah. the is whether you know your food is alive or dead when you're eating, <laughs> Gonna turn a whole group of players into vegetarians with this. <laughs> yeah, it's escalated quickly in the chat. <laughs> well, I, I mean, they're not a major player race, but they're an option, right? Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. I I always argue with the fans over uh, the nature of necromancy 
and no. necromancers in general. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm like firmly in the camp that you cannot be a good necromancer, or if you are, you can't be. You can't be like raising the undead and still be good. It's just a tool, no. man. You're not you're not trapping their spirit. You're just animating their their bones and corpses. Then, then why is it animate dead and then you don't just use animate object? That's uh, well. You see, we went a different Cause direction because you took because uh, uh, animate objects class was filled up at wizard school and the only thing open was <laughs> animate dead, so just fell into it. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how those choices at wizard school define the rest of your right? career. Yeah. <laughs> so we did something that I, I usually don't do. And we put your Patreon in the description along with a bunch of, you know, your website and the social. Oh, hey, thank you. Um, but the reason is you guys are doing something inter interesting over there on your Patreon. And, you know, even, uh, I, you know, you pointed out and spotted uh, Doug, you know, has, you know, has a copy of one of those interesting things. Oh, I like it. Mm -hmm. So, what do you guys have going on over there? Well, Warlock is our is our Patreon and a collection of fifth edition uh, lore for Midgard, new rules, new monsters, new magic. Uh, so, the first one, for instance, has um, a new plant monster. Uh, it has a section on an Eastern Kingdom with a map. Um, and the next one is coming. Oh, and in between those, so we do them in print and in PDF for like five bucks. Um, but it, you get them for one dollar a month, you get the PDF. And we're doing layers. We're doing a new layer every month um, with a, a map from Dyson Logos and uh, designed by like, James Hake or Chris Harris or Dan Dillon or somebody, me. Um, and, and so that way we're basically setting ourselves up to have a constant steady stream of fifth edition stuff that's portable and uh, new Midgard material. Because one of the things everybody knows about campaign settings is, you know, they, once they stop publishing or if there's not enough new interesting material, people drift away and they find something else new and shiny. So, so Warlock is basically putting us on the hook to make sure there's always something new, cool, uh, new magic items, new NPCs, new adventure locations, uh, and a lair you can drop into your game, you know, whenever you want. So yeah, we hope people keep backing it. We've got like 400 backers right now, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but our, our dream eventually is to have enough backers to basically collect all of those, um, layers and, uh, booklets into a hardcover, like the Warlock's Grimoire or something like that, and do like a full color cover and a big layout and, you know, make it a big bound book. We're a long way from that yet, but... Um, but you know what? Even in this day and age, to be able to get something in the mail is kind of cool. Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, we made it just a little thing because, you know, we weren't sure that the funds would be there to support, like, anything, big glossy supplements or whatever. We just want, like, a little booklet now and again, um, and we'll put them out about every other month. Uh, maybe I love the months. format. Yeah. It's, I mean, the art is by Carl Waller on that one, like the cover mm -hmm. artist. He did a ton of art for Al Kadim, so I have, yeah, I have a great fondness for his style. Um, it's really. Classic. I'm sure Dan Dillon does also. Yeah, I think Dan. Like, <laughs> he knows Carl Waller did like all the interior art for, uh, for Al Kadim, and we were just lucky that he said, "Yeah, sure, sign me up. I'll do a couple covers and some interiors, and that'll be that." I mean, he's got. Been 20 years since Al Qadim too, right? <laughs> he's doing other things. He's a photographer. I don't know what all he's got cooking, but he made time for us, and we're like, "Yay, we got some cool covers." Um, <laughs> Sounds like a win-win to me. Yeah. Well, you know, there are some of these artists who you think of, and they really define a particular period, like Trampier and Wormy from the early Dragon days, or um, you know, Elmore for certain types of covers and Dragonlance in particular. Um, and so, yeah, we can snag a, a black and white legend to do some some great stuff and make Warlock shine. We'll, we'll say, yeah. 
I think we have a couple other surprises too, names that people will recognize, but that's like book three. So not quite right away. Nice. Well, I mean, it's definitely cool anyway, because I remember, and like, I think, you know, Doug does as well. And a lot of people in our audience does is being able to get like that dungeon and dragon magazine every month. Sure. And, you know, oh, and, yeah. and you know, you know, I, we've talked about it before on the show, but there's a huge difference between getting something digitally and getting something in the mail and, and kind of like not knowing quite what you're going to get every month. Oh yeah. It, 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 it's like, you know, it's kind of like, they've kind of been replaced by subscription boxes yeah. subscription boxes. It's like, I don't know. It, it, it doesn't have it never it didn't have they don't have the same pull to me as like getting a dragon magazine or or the warlock magazine or something like that sure well, i think you nailed it by saying you don't know what you're going to get like you know i'm sure you can browse around online and find different things but you know this it's like like you said it's got all kinds it's got like ecology stuff or like an npc or like here's a new monster yep so I mean, it's you meant to discover be, new things. Yeah, an idea starter, get you motivated, make you say, hey, I'm going to DM this, or, oh, that's a cool bit of lore. I'm just going to throw that in. Um, and, I mean, we're not, we're not taking uh, advertising. We don't have a slush pile. It's pretty much highly curated, right? Like, we go out and say, hey, Dan Dillon, write this thing for us. And he does, or Richard Green. <laughs> We'd like to have a piece from you on X, Y, or Z. Um, so it's pretty targeted, and we're trying to make sure each little book is sort of on a theme. Like the first one is all about Cthulhu mythos -y influences. It's pretty dark. The second one will be about uh, about magic. So it's going to have a lot of enchanters, wizards, magic items. Um, yeah. At this I'm, point, I'm not going to say the Z word, but it, that's what it reminds me of. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It is a little. But it's I a think booklet. It, a booklet. It's a booklet. It's, it, I mean, the premise for me was those three little booklets from 1974, right? Ah, okay, yeah, nice. It's kind of like, let's go back and make it fairly primitive. Let's not do color. Let's keep the costs down so people can you know, afford it. Mm -hmm. um, and we that seems to be them. going around because we had uh, Frank Menser on, and, yeah. he's, they're, and they're kind of doing the same thing as part of their box set. Oh, cool! Is that oh, little, yeah. they have you know a handful of little booklets to go in there in addition to all the other stuff for Imperia. Oh my goodness, yeah, I'm, Imperia is mega ambitious, and I hope Frank pulls it off because if anybody can, it's him. Um, I I was when I, I didn't even look at the the goal when I first looked at it, and I just looked I just looked at the names. I'm like, this looks like a million dollar Kickstarter. Yeah, quarter quarter million, I think. That's that's yeah. his minimum, and I'm like, yeah. Frank, you probably should have chopped it into like the first three systems, and then a stretch goal for the next three systems because he's doing like ten game systems. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And I'm like, uh, but what if what if you don't? <laughs> I don't know. I think he's gonna make it, but it's gonna be close. See. Let's see. He's a tough old buzzard. I'm rooting for him. I think he's got it. Yep, yep, definitely. So, and you know, if anybody knows the the early history, certainly he does. Um, oh yeah, he we had him on. He was a great guest. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so you guys have done a ton of stuff. Do you have a favorite, like you know, of you know all the Cobalt products? Is there one that like of all the Cobalt products? Yeah. Pick, do you have a favorite child? I, I, oh, geez, that's tough. Um, I have a favorite adventure and I have a favorite supplement, but I don't know if I can choose between the two. So I'll just give them both, right? Like at the moment, my favorite supplement is Tome of Beast because it just, I've wanted to do a monster book forever, like a big one with color. And I wasn't sure we could afford it before Kickstarter. Ooh, you did do a big one. That is for sure. This thing. Oh yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah, man. This is. Yeah. <laughs> this the, this is great. I've used red red uh, the red caps. I've used um, the mini krakens. I can't remember the na name of them off the top of my head. Krakens. Yeah. Krakens. Yeah. 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 I like the I like the weird stuff. The memoir. Uh, yeah. The Migo, I've used Migo several times to my I've, player's dismay. I have used the Migo, well, 
I mean, I played enough Cthulhu that it's like, oh, well, yep. <laughs> you gotta put some of this in there. And all. Oh, yeah. Cthulhu- how did you guys? How did you guys get the 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 uh, basis from White Zombie to model for your cover? <laughs> <laughs> Just lucky, you know, there's connections. A lot of musicians are gamers. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's my favorite supplement of the moment. I think for adventures, I got to say Courts of the Shadow Fae. Um, just because it was a fourth edition thing and then a Pathfinder thing. And I guess uh, we're announcing it on your show. It's going to be a fifth edition thing. Yeah. So, nice. yeah. A lot of, lot of uh, interest in Fae stuff recently. Yeah. Seems like. I mean, it's part of the Midgard setting. It's one of the things we pull for. I think the Feywild kicked off some of that. Um, I don't know. I've maybe Changeling fans cross over. I don't know. People sure. got their fill of fantasy in space. Now it's like, I want my fantasy with a fairy twist to it. That's yeah. The, the Shadowfell and the Feywild were great additions. Yeah. To the cosmology. I, I agree. I think. Were they both fourth edition? They were. I th- they? I think they were. I, uh, there's some things that kind of have bled over. Like there was so many, so much stuff that came out of third, and like right. it could have been like in a in a source book somewhere, and then it got mm-hmm. like Dragonborn had a different incarnation in third edition, and then when it got moved to you know fourth edition, so you know so I think they, they, they got a lot more play in fourth, mm-hmm. or like the uh, Tome of Battle stuff. It was like right at the end of thir- three point five, and yeah, then it's like, like you know, what book of nine swords? Was yeah, that? that's what, yeah. yeah, that's the one. Yeah, there was a lot of four ish stuff in there. I mean, you see this, right? You see them experiment, and they put it out. Now, I guess they put it up on Unearthed Arcana. Say these rules are not official. Trust nothing. <laughs> Go play and tell us. <laughs> tell us whether you like it, right? It's a great model. I mean, it's a great way to get your get your playtesting done. That's for sure. Oh yeah, they're playtesting like mad. People love to give their opinion, and <laughs> I'm hoping that most people who respond on those surveys haven't just read it, but have actually played it. Right. Um, I'm sure there is a fair bit of both. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, that's what you're gonna get when you just put it <laughs> open to the public, right? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that being said, you know, with more eyeballs on the thing and different perspectives. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure there's a closed playtest loop as well where they're, like, actually expecting reports to be written up. And, you know, they're working with however many, a few hundred groups. Um, but, yeah, the playtest is great. And, and it means when they finally do ship whatever, their Mystic or their Revised Ranger or whatever, it's um, it's solid. Time will tell, but yeah. So, what is speaking of play testing? What do you guys do for play testing? What is you know, what does it look like over at Cobalt Press? Well, it's not quite as extensive as Wizards because we can't just put something out and have a hundred thousand people go, oh me me me. Understandable. Um, but we do have a rugged and dependable play test program. Uh, it's run primarily by Ben McFarland. Um, and all the adventures certainly get hammered on. A lot of them go through convention play for a few rounds uh, and then farmed out to play testers for a few rounds uh, before we publish them. Um, and, and sort of core rules material, uh, we have the same sort of system where we usually go to Kickstarter backers and say, okay, whatever it is, five, six hundred people, a thousand people who are backers, um, please play test this. For Tome of Beasts, like, we had 400 monsters, and I think we got 250 of them play tested, some of them by multiple groups. The ones that were hard to play test were the things like, I don't know, CR 25 Demon Lords. Right? <laughs> it was like, anybody, anybody want to play test this? And A, you know, the DMs are like, I'm not ready to run that. And the players are like, I don't have a character for that. I guess I could just write up a uh, you know, 20th level party. Um, and others were, were monsters that came in late or that we had already play tested to death in-house or that, frankly, were simple enough. Like, this is a dinosaur. It fits the power curve exactly. Hmm. 
are we gonna are we gonna test it? No. Um, yeah, I imagine some things are just no brainers. You just you can kind of eye, eyeball them. Yeah, some you can eyeball, but sometimes it'll surprise you. So we wanted to have every single monster get multiple play tests. Uh, in practice, I think it was about three quarters, two thirds of it. Um, and a lot of them came back saying, hey, this is fine. My group had a good time. Um, and then a lot came back with, well, that was a TPK. I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> or, you know, it was fine, except it was super grindy, man. It, you know, high AC, high hit points. It's balanced. We won, but it was boring, right? Oh, yeah. Um, and it's like, oh, that's interesting feedback. All right, well, we don't want this to be a grind fest monster, but we do want it to feel defensive. How do we do that? Let's go back to the drawing board a little bit and do that a different way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I can't say that we play test to the level that Wizards does, largely because we just don't have that infrastructure and that mass audience. But man, do we believe in play tests. We have since the beginning. Um, so, what I'm hearing is you, you put you put your top Cobalt Chiefs on it and get as yeah. many Cobalt Minions involved. Sounds yeah. good to me, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I think it shows in the final product. There's still stuff that slips past us. Heck, there's stuff that slips past Wizards. But um, Looking at you, Ranger. Yeah. <laughs> I like the Ranger, man. I like the Ranger just fine, but I, I can see how it doesn't suit everyone's play style. <laughs> And it's different than the prior edition Ranger, which mm -hmm. is with those people. It's an explorer. Yeah. I, well, I, I agree. I actually I actually like the aspects that people don't like about the Ranger, I actually like. I only I only mm -hmm. rag on the Beast Companion a little bit, and that's only because when I when you look at the it depends on your DM, but right. I'm the kind of DM if you put if you put your your pets in the fray, I hit them. Oh you're yeah, a but see, one, the beast, Mr. Grinch. The beast is your weapon. It, it it should be in the fray, not you. Yeah, well, that's, that's what you're that's attacking. One shot it. Sure. Well, it can have a decent AC. I mean, it gets your crap bonus and stuff. Oh yeah, like everything about the beast is good, except for the hit points. And also, you know, it's not a magical beast. It's just a beast. So it's like, well, if your wolf dies, it's like, oh, sorry, but I'll just go out in the woods and get another one. Get another one. That's, na that's nature, man. Yeah. Free giant crab. <laughs> Oh, exactly. We've made the joke about the, the fantasy PETA <laughs> for the Rangers because they're constantly going back for a new uh, Beast Companion. Yes. Yeah, they are. But, you know, you just here yesterday and picked up a puppy? <laughs> I'm looking for a giant crab. What do you got in a giant crab? <laughs> Not much call for those, but this is what we got. <laughs> yeah, I, it's good fun. I... I'm really pleased with the way fifth is developing. Um, I'm really happy with like the fan base seems to have embraced it in new and interesting ways. Um, and Cobalt press is obviously like all about supporting it. Um, so yeah, the update to Midgard is a big deal for us, but the other one we've got coming is we're going to do the next home of beasts, right? We're going to do our, our follow up to that. Um, so everything we learned about monsters the first time around, we're going to, apply to the new one man i figured at this point you've, you've made them all <laughs> oh you always, always more monsters yeah, but you know like three five had like five or six monster manuals yeah you beat me to it i know and i, like, I think i'm looking at them too because i have a, another bookshelf like on the other side of the computer right and like pathfinder is up to bestiary six or seven so <laughs> yeah yeah and they you they know, sent they, they we don't really play Pathfinder, but they'll send us the books, and they look so good. Oh my gosh, the art on those monsters! <laughs> I know, and they've done all the Cthulhu ones, and they've done weird alien robot stuff, so I can run Barrier Peaks, and <laughs> yeah, they've got all that. I mean, honestly, my my Pathfinder days are are kind of over, honestly. Although there are still some Cobalt minions who are way into it so it's like the company's still on pathfinder releases now and again but it feels like the industry weight has shifted uh, so strongly to 5e that it's it's hard to justify um well four was a divider and i guess five is the uniter i guess yeah have you guys been able to or is there any plans to or can we even talk about D D beyond 
Yeah, I would love to, um, but it's not open to us, right? It's not our call. They have to decide that. I think they've got their hands full just getting everything in. They got Volos in, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're putting all the stuff in there. They're putting it all in, um, and maybe there's not as much as I think. I mean, yeah, if they want to take the Midgard Heroes Handbook or the Deep Magic stuff or any of that and put it in there, I'd be 100% in favor. But right now, what we've got is we're putting all of our uh, adventures out on Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds. Um, but that's kind of my point. Like, you guys are already doing it. They're already absorbing it, you know, yeah. from, you know, from what Watts. Like, I, I feel like yeah, I like I don't know how different how much different on the you know their end and, and you know fantasy ground and roll twenty how much how much different that stuff all is but it seems like it's all there we just need to put it in one more spot <laughs> <laughs> yeah and they all do it slightly differently and converting it uh, I mean it's a bunch of work right to get it to work seamlessly and well. Um, and they have automated tools that help them with some of that, but they've still got to test it all and people will beat on it. And so, yeah, I'd love to be on D&D Beyond, but I, I think they're going to stay first party only is my guess. I can see over time, though, once they get, you know, I mean, because they're still like working things out right now. But I mean, if it persists for any length of time, I could see that in time having like certain other yeah. party stuff. Sure. Yeah, no, Cobalt Press would be wide open to that. Uh, maybe <laughs> by that point, we'll have caught up on our Roll20 and Fantasy Grounds, right? Mm -hmm. I, well, no, you guys, you know, you guys have been on Dragon Talk, and you're friends with all those guys, so. Sure, and, but, and, <laughs> I, I mean, I know. it's not our decision, right? They're I the know, I totally, dollar public company. I totally understand that. And I, you know, one of the things that a lot of people seem to not realize too, and or forget or overlook, is the fact that D and D Beyond isn't actually it doesn't actually have anything to do with Wizards of the Coast. Right. They just license through them, and you know they're just a partner like any other business. Sure. Um, same as Fantasy Grounds, Roll Twenty. So we're we're hoping once they get caught up that we can get some of our other favorite, uh, you know, five uh, E content in there as well because I. I do like using the tools over there. I have to admit, it's so much easier. Yeah. The search feature, yeah, is uh, so much easier than going through a bunch of different books. Yes, and and I'm not really that into virtual tabletops. Right. So it like fits a niche that I like. I used to really enjoy the fourth edition digital tools, mm -hmm. and it's very similar to that. And that's that's probably why I like it. Right. Well, I'm glad they provide it. Um, I know some people quibbled about price or quantity of material that was free. Uh, I, I mean, from my perspective, I have some sense of how much work it is to create a tool like that. I'm like, I'm not arguing about the price. <laughs> yeah. <People> to me, <laughs> I'm glad they're doing it. Um, it's clear that Roll20 and, and Fantasy Grounds are way more about the virtual tabletop experience, right? Um, but yeah, I don't know. They're all fighting over that space and whose tool set is most interesting and what do you get value for money. Um, but yeah, they should uh, at some point. Absolutely. We'll, we'll start lobbying for 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 at least for at least you know for at least uh, the Toma Beast getting in there. Sure. Uh, oh my God, that'd be awesome. I think the Toma Beasts. I mean, I got approached not that long ago. Okay, quite a while um, about. <laughs> licensing Toma Beasts into other languages. And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. Except do you even have the D and D core rules in this language? <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. People uh, might just want to read it, read it for I the lore. I think they have though. Didn't, wasn't there an announcement? announcement there was, it, it was, I think it was announced maybe at Gamma this year. It was a few months back and they said that I think it was like maybe German, French and Spanish, German, French, and I can't remember, but it was like the core European languages. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, localization program. That's yeah. kind of like a comment we get occasionally too. Is like that about you know, you know, people trying to play D and D in other languages, and you know, and how how it could be tough. Well, you most know? of the Germans I talked, I've had a partnership with this Ulysses Spiel company. They've distributed some of my kickstarters in the EU. Um, 
they say the reason we learned English is we wanted to play RPGs, right? <laughs> we were trying to read the player's handbook, so we had to learn English. Um, and I, I think that's a great motivation to. That's how we will dominate the world with with English. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Get rid of the metric system while you're at it. Uh, well, I can look that. <laughs> Uh, uh, Dan is actually in the chat. He said he met some lovely people at Gen Con that were doing Italian translation of KP material. Yes. Yes. Cool. It's true. Um, the Italians are on it. The French are on it. The Germans. Um, awesome. Let's uh, take a break and dive into the the chat for roll call uh, got, and see where people are ha hanging out and coming uh, coming to us from. We usually do that around the halfway mark. We're a little bit past that, so I think it's time, guys. It's time for roll call. Sound off. Not a whole lot of question. There a lot of discussion in there. Zarif yeah, gaming well, doesn't even have his usual daily his, question. His one question. He might. He might be holding it. You never know. <laughs> He's got it in his back pocket. Just, just in case. So uh, we've got poison in in Kuwait. We've got uh, Todd in Dallas. We've got Lincoln in Sweden, Paul's in Pittsburgh, and John is in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, I see True Mate in, in there, and he's in Wales. I've also seen Zarif Gaming, and he's in Redizio, New Mexico. It looks like we do have some uh, some Germany in the house with Sebastian. We have Redmond, Washington with his Mercs. I'm not sure if that's how you say that or not. We got Orlando, Florida in the house with uh, Julian. Uh, Idaho with the man from the road to the farm. We've got Utah with Regilio. Dan Dillon is in Indianapolis, but I think you probably already knew that. Uh, Justin is in Tennessee. And Ryan is in Ohio. We've got Dallas with Brendan. We've got Eric in West Virginia. We've got Jay in uh, Portugal. So uh, we've got people tuning in from all over the place. We may have thrown things off a little bit because we ch changed the time a little bit today. So, uh, but we've had about 40 people ish hanging out with us. So that's pretty cool. Thanks guys. Always appreciate you weighing in. So can we expect the Kickstarter for the, for the next phase of Midgard? Well, um, we had one for the core books and the question now is really, okay, that's going to ship in the winter. We're, we're getting down to shipping files to press. What comes next, right? Once we've laid the foundation of a Midgard player's handbook, all those deep magic supplements collected, um, once we have the core setting book out with all the awesome maps, um, where do we go from there? Well, there's sort of two main directions that we're discussing. Um, and it's not clear yet what phase two is. It's either we take the Southlands, which takes all of Africa and Arabia and Egypt and puts a beautiful fantasy spin on it and you know, more tombs to loot, pyramids, jungles, desert, everything. Uh, it's very Cholt friendly for one thing. Um, and we, we take all that out of Pathfinder and into 5e because people have keep asking us, so when's the Southlands coming to 5e? Part of my answer is, we already did the South Guard races. You can play heroes. You can run adventures. Um, but it's obviously nicer to have a whole book that's like been brought yeah. into 5e. They want it all. Yeah, well, <laughs> but we can only convert so much at a time, right? So the other option is we turn east and we say, the glorious east, the utter east, what is out there? Um, and that would be essentially as much of a fantasy Asia as we can cram into a set of covers, um, China and India, um, all the Angkor Wat strangeness, Indonesian pirate wizards, um, the high mountains, the monkey kings, the flying cities of Sikkim. Um, we could really go to town on a fantasy Asia. And that would be everything from you know, samurai to mystics to maybe psionic Hindi magic. I don't know. I don't know yet. I've got two guys who are 
rattling together a really awesome outline for it, but we can only yeah. pull the trigger on one of those two things. I, I'm sure you got one guy that's like dying to write some like Arabian Night type stuff. Yeah, and that would be all Southlands, right? It's like we could take that and go because we've got that material. We've got the city and the sand ships and the knoll slavers and the salt mines and the genies and so, so the, it sounds like the dilemma for you guys is do we rehash the old stuff or yep. we make some new stuff and play with something new? Yeah. And it's like, well, in addition to that, we're going to keep doing all the adventures and small kind of supplements and city books. Um, we'll probably update Zobek at some point. We'll, uh, we'll bring all those things. But for the next big bet, it's, it's a coin flip right now, and I don't know which way we're going to jump. When you update or uh, adapt things for 5e in the process, is there ever any um, like opportunity like, hey, why don't we think about like how time has changed since we wrote this thing? So while you're updating the rules, it's like the setting actually changes a little bit too. Like, oh, yeah. you know, things I mean, like factions might have moved or, or give you like new ideas for, for things yeah. to add to the expansion. I mean, we do. We like adding sort of smaller chunks over time rather than like spell plaguing it up or throwing meteors from orbit and just <laughs> throwing everything off kilter. But I mean, the original Midgard was built and it's in the introduction, right? This is a world where we have built it to collapse and have conflict. So, you know, go break things was sort of the, the instruction to the DMs because we've set up a whole lot of flashpoints for uh, for adventure and disaster and things to go wrong. Um, so we are always looking to tweak and change and stick the knife in somewhere. But, I mean, the passage of time is tricky. I don't want it to move 100 years in a jump ever if I can help it. But five years or 10 years or this king's deposed, yeah, absolutely. Um, those kind of smaller scale changes I think are healthy for a setting they keep it from getting stale um and they frankly allow us to fix things if we made a mistake somewhere we realize eh, this character is kind of boring mm -hmm. oh, it might yeah. entice people that were playing you know the established pathfinder stuff too like hey man try it this 5e thing exactly there's new stuff in this setting i like right yeah. it's like you know you had interest in this storyline well guess what um you know that that has advanced. Um, here's what some of the changes are. Here's some details about it. Um, and then, of course, it's always up to people whether they want to roll that official canon into their home game. If if they built their premise on, we're playing in this kingdom right next to the Dragon Empire and it's under threat, but it's not conquered, then fine, right? It's not conquered, no matter what happens in official canon. Right. Um, and... Mm -hmm. You kind of beat me too, because I was going to ask if there's an overarching storyline, and like, like Tug said, you know, introducing the new edition stuff kind of gives you the chance to visit that storyline. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, things do change in the new book, um, but it's all still fairly familiar. It's like the vampires and ghouls may be meaner and nastier and have had some battlefield successes, but they're still essentially the same culture, right? the same villains we're just giving you more information about them um but yeah it's i don't see the point of putting out a new edition of a setting where nothing has changed but it's always that fine balance of how much to change at a time i'm sure there are going to be people who scream you changed my favorite <laughs> thing uh, <laughs> and there's going to be other people who are pleased right it's like oh i so happy with X or Y. I finally have what I wanted for that. Um, you're never going to please absolutely everyone, but that's a lesson you learn as a designer fairly early on is it has to make sense to you. You have to have the larger vision of where's this going in the long run. Um, and you have to keep it fresh. So that's what we're after. Have you guys ever considered doing any other campaign settings? Yeah, <laughs> we, we thought for a microsecond about doing a science fiction campaign setting. And then I said, no, no, we're a fantasy and horror group. We don't do SF. 
Um, and there's been talk, I always get people pitching us. Here's my campaign world in 300 binders, publish it. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, well, did you bring, you know, a $50,000 art budget along with you? Where am I going to do that? Uh, and also, we've already got one. So I'm, I'm not eager to take on a second setting. It's all we can do to keep up with the first one. Um, and to provide sufficient support through like the convention adventures that we put out every year and often they're new um, the supplements the uh, magic books uh, the warlock booklets the lore um, so we're super reluctant to take on a second one I think I think it's possible but I have to quit my day job that kind of thing <laughs> it used to be the thing though back in the 80s it was just like I know full campaign setting up a full campaign setting. Well, that was the norm. It was, but look where that got them, right? <laughs> yeah, I really want to do another one, but I'm so happy with the way this one is in the new edition that I'm like, I just want to play around in it for a while. If if time and money weren't an issue, what what would that cam other campaign setting look like? What would that look like? Oh wow. Well, now, if we're just talking total blue sky, right? Yeah, whatever whatever Wolfgang would put in there. We, the other game he wants to play that he's not playing now. Well, usually the answer to that is, oh, you mean Call of Cthulhu? Yeah, that exists. I don't have to write it. It's already been written. Um, <laughs> but if it's not that either, man, I would love to do... Um, oh, I'd love to do something smaller. Um instead of a giant world thing, but something more indie-like, like, you know, My Life with Master or uh, one of these sort of drawing room kind of games. I don't know if that's quite a world setting, right? But it might be just a Wizards Collegium, an Academy, a Gaslight District. I don't know. I have most of what I want somewhere in Midgard is the problem, right? <laughs> well, I guess that's the point, too. Like, if you're going to do one campaign... You're gonna put everything in there that you would like to would like to see what you want to play with, right? I mean, I could run a separate campaign and call it the Valley of the Lizard Kings, and it would be all dinosaurs and lizard men, and slee stacks, and it would be totally Land of the Lost, and you know, let's do cavemen for a while, and that could be a six month campaign. But I have a place I can put that in Midgard, <laughs> so. So, it sounds like you'd be more interested in, in playing with themes. Yeah, probably. I mean, if I were going to do a science fiction thing, which was briefly on the drawing board, it would be um, a near future biopunk setting. And I would be looking really closely at novels like Wind Up Girl or The Water Knife or something like that. Um, and I might build it on top of Starfinder rules or I might go with Fate. Well, that is the one thing. We're not starved for choices as far as, you know, if you want to move in a direction. It's kind of a golden age for that, right? Like, there are open game systems everywhere. Uh, there's opportunities. Um, I see some of the games online, the actual play stuff, and I'm like, damn, I'm glad they recorded that. Cause... I, we so often get asked that question, how do you do X with, with Z? Yeah. Um, and I'm just kind of like... X already exists, or Z already exists. Why would you even bother trying? <laughs> like, just go yeah. learn. Just go learn this new rule set and go get your your on the ground running, or use or use one of these really generic rules light systems where you can play almost anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there. It depends on what your flavor of the month is. If you want super deep rule sets, you got those. If you like fast and light indie stuff, we got room for that. Oh, man, I had a tarot-based rule system I was monkeying with for a while. Well, tarot-based, card-based, let's say. Yeah. And it was fun, but I'm like, yeah, I think there's a market for this. People love dice. Um, so I monkeyed around with it, and I satisfied my curiosity, and I said, eh, I'm just going to put this aside on the shelf because, you know, the amount of work required to make it publishable probably yeah. wouldn't be worth it. There's at least one card-based game that I know of. Yeah, which one? Uh, Phoenix Dawn Command. Oh, yeah. And oh, that's, 
Give me the uh, check that one out. Have you played it or seen it? I have not. <laughs> I just know of it. <laughs> and I only know of it because of, because we had uh, Keith on the show a couple times. Well, I mean, with Keith behind it, I, I yeah, it went on my list at one point, but my reading pile is kind of like other people's reading piles. So it's never going yeah, to until I retire. I, I totally get that. And like we always get asked about, have you tried this system or played that system? And just like, it's hard enough to play the games we're already playing sometimes, you know, with schedules and time. And, and uh, you know, time is the only thing that seems to be a uh, finite in my life. So you have to choose. Yeah, you do. So, I mean, we all make our choices. I'm pretty happy with the choices at Cobalt. Um, it's just, I do like to get out once in a while and somebody says, hey, let's play OD&D out of three booklets or let's play Numenera or Cthulhu or, heck, Phoenix Dawn Command. Maybe I should get people around for that. And oh, yeah. That was actually it. my next question, too, is like, you know, you run, you run, you know, a, a large, one of the largest third-party publishing companies. You have a full-time gig. You're like a professional pokey trainer or something. Uh -huh. And, and uh, you know, does that leave time for actually, you know, enjoying gaming? It does, but it's it's kind of like when I was at TSR, right? It's like the thing you don't necessarily want to play is the thing you've been working on and working on and working on. Because you get overwhelmed with it. Um, and yet I'm in a Ravenloft campaign that's, I'm sorry, a Curse of Strahd campaign that's about to wrap up. Um, I've got Cthulhu games now and again, and I've got my own play tests. I've got my convention games. I'm looking forward to some of those in November. Um, there is time to play, but it's, it's not as copious as everyone thinks it is. <laughs> it's like, I want to make sure this thing works. Well, I wrote it. I could run it, but then if I'm running it, I will not see my own flaws. It would be much more efficient to hand it to, I don't know, Ben, and say, Ben, you run it and tell me everything that's wrong with it. Um, ben will run it. Ben will run anything. Yeah, well, he, and he'll run it well, and then he'll have a detailed report on everything I did wrong, how it worked at the table. It's like, these three encounters are fine, but these seven, let me tell you about them. And I'm like, okay, Ben. <laughs> so... And, you know, that's why we have developers and other people to, to look at stuff. I'll run other people's stuff and and poke holes at it. That but playtesting your own stuff is the least efficient way to playtest it. Definitely makes sense. Will you guys have a, a presence of PAX Unplugged this year? Oh, man, we almost did. We, we, <laughs> we almost had a booth share working, and then I ran the numbers, and I – got scared i got cold feet i hope that thing is a monster huge hit of a show i'm 100 percent behind it it is however on the other coast and um and even a, a medium-sized third-party company has to think pretty hard before committing to pax kind of money um because unlike say those video game folks at pax prime and pax east and pax south and pax australia it's like we pinch our pennies pretty hard um, before we commit to an appearance like that. So we're not going to be there this year, as best I can tell, um, which is a darn shame because it looks like it's going to be a great show. It's right in that Northeast corridor. I don't know. I, I hope it's, it prospers and everybody goes and everybody loves it um, because having a big East Coast tabletop convention, and that would be great. Are you yeah, going? Yeah, we're pretty excited for it. It's it's literally in our backyard. Oh, we're, at, we're out of New Jersey, so. Oh, see, that's what I mean. Everybody along the Atlantic seaboard is like, oh, it's Philly. I can get there. Well, it's literally like 30 minutes from my house. So oh. I, when people are like asking, hey, are you guys going to go to Pax Plug? I was like, I kind of feel like we have to. <laughs> you, do. Well, you must. I think you're going to have a good time. Every the thing I hear from people is, yeah, we're, we're going in, we're going to you know, all these demos and all these games, and we're really hoping people show up. And I'm like, don't worry about it. It's PAX. They always sell out. Right? Yeah, they're going to they're gonna come. Come to the, the city of brotherly love. Yeah. The oh, Nerdarchy is actually helping out with uh, for Open Legend. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, 
We're gonna be booth beards. Yeah. <laughs> Ah, that's the somewhat more bearded version of the Booth Bay, but I see you. Yes, yeah. Uh, <laughs> good. I like that. Um, uh, you will be wise. You will be demoing. You will be voiceless by the end of the show. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. I mean, we ran, we ran an open legend game out there that was kind of like a mishmash of uh, horror and fantasy and steampunk. Awesome. So you know, it's a lot of fun. So we're going to go there and run some games for those folks and hang out at the table. We got to convince Doug to get out there, but I think he's used all of his, all of his vacation time for Gen Con and Origins. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I'm looking at Origins for next year. Um, I think Cobalt Press will have a booth at Origins 2018. Um, you guys, well, you guys, were, you guys had a room for ta uh, games. Yes, at Gen Con, we had a whole room for games. We ran a huge slate of events, and I think, I think largely successfully, I didn't hear a lot of complaints this year. We're, we're starting to figure it out. Uh, nice. <laughs> to run a big, big track, because um, it's not obvious. Although, if you hear no complaints, you must be doing something wrong. Some yeah, I'm sure we are. are. <laughs> Somebody's just like, this is so bad, I'm not even telling them. <laughs> Because gamers don't love to complain. Wait. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> but yeah, for the most part, it's people show up. They said, oh my God, the tickets aren't even that pricey because we didn't, we didn't jack up our tickets or anything. We just wanted people to show up. So it worked. Yeah, DSDJKK, Dave in a bikini. I don't think anyone needs to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, well, hopefully, hopefully, uh, maybe some some of the, the kobold minions will make it out to uh, to Pax Unplugged. That would be cool. I think so. There's a couple of scouts we're sending to see what it's like. Oh, nice. Um, and they're gonna go around and say, you know, hey, the Pelgrane booth was awesome because they did X, and the Paizo demo area was smart because they did Y, and we'll try to learn from what they're all doing. Has Wizards committed to that show? I'm not even sure. I don't, I don't even, I don't know. Um, I should probably like investigate this stuff more, you would think. Well, I, I think a lot of the higher profile people that play D&D &D are going to be there, but I don't know if Wizards, like I know Critical Role people are going to be there and stuff, and like the DCA I think is doing a game there, or maybe Acquisitions Inc. Oh, good. Or both. Awesome. Hey. Oddly enough, I, I generally know more about like other content creators that are doing stuff yeah. there than I do about the actual, I guess, the industry people that these things are kind of built around. Dan Dillon's got the scoop. He says Chris Perkins slash Acquisitions Inc. is going to be there. Awesome. Oh yeah, I think they're they got like a big audience hall for them. Mm -hmm. And then also, I know Open Legends is going to be doing their GM improv thing again. So that you know that should be a lot of fun. It's gonna be a lot of good stuff. It's gonna be a good time for sure. Uh, you know, for a first year show, it's being organized and staffed, and it's just coming together. It, even from way over here, where I'm looking at it and thinking, "Is this a good deal?" It's clear people are gonna have a great time. So, have, have you considered uh, making the pilgrimage out just as an attendee? Yeah, you know that is way more tempting. Often, it's like I have done Gen Con that way on occasion. Um, with no booth and I always get more out of the show in some ways because you have time to slow down and talk to people. So yeah, I'd love to, uh, it would be a nice way to sort of see what other people are doing, catch up with the field as a whole, maybe play a couple games at a convention. <laughs> Whoa, that could be crazy. Now you're just out of control. <laughs> well, I mean, at the small shows like North, Texas RPG Con or Game Hole, right? They're small enough that you can play, and you don't feel like I'm not, I'm not enjoying the show. I'm not doing everything. Um, but once they hit like ten or twenty thousand, you know, Origins Gen Con packs, it's really hard to carve out the time. Yeah, you're you, you're just there working. Yeah. Like, no, I, to I totally get that. So we are coming right up on that hour mark. Is there anything you want to leave folks with before we head on out? Well, um, I'm super excited to uh, to say that the Midgard campaign setting five years on is 
headed to press and headed to print, and we're going to have Deep Magic compiled in the Heroes Handbook. And yeah, it's going to be a really good 2018 for Cobalt Press um, and Fifth Edition. Uh, and if you want to hear more about it, by all means, uh, back us on the Warlock Patreon. I'm, it's an old model, but a good one. And we'd love to have you there. So yeah, check us out if you haven't already. We're having a good time with it, and we got a lot of little surprises and some really big, juicy hardcovers uh, headed your way in 2018. Awesome! And guys, you can find the links to you know to pretty much all that stuff in the description as always. And I want to thank you for hanging out with us today, Wolfgang and Doug, oh, thank you. And everybody who's been in the chat as well. Uh, until next time, guys. Stay nerdy. Stay nerdy.